A speech act in linguistics and the philosophy of language is an utterance that has performative function in language and communication. According to Kent Bach, "...almost any speech act is really the performance of several acts at once, distinguished by different aspects of the speaker's intention. There is the act of saying something, what one does in saying it, such as requesting or promising, and how one is trying to affect one's audience." The contemporary use of the term goes back to J. L. Austin's development of performative utterances and his theory of locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary acts. Speech acts are commonly taken to include such acts as promising, ordering, greeting, warning, inviting and congratulating. <laughs> locutionary, illocutionary and perlocutionary acts Speech acts can be analyzed on three levels. A locutionary act, the performance of an utterance, the actual utterance and its ostensible meaning, comprising phonetic, phatic and retic acts corresponding to the verbal, syntactic and semantic aspects of any meaningful utterance. An illocutionary act, the pragmatic illocutionary force of the utterance, thus its intended significance as a socially valid verbal action see below and in certain cases a further perlocutionary act, its actual effect, such as persuading, convincing, scaring, enlightening, inspiring, or otherwise getting someone to do or realize something, whether intended or not Austin 1962 Topic. Illocutionary acts The concept of an illocutionary act is central to the concept of a speech act. Although there are numerous opinions regarding how to define illocutionary acts, there are some kinds of acts which are widely accepted as illocutionary, as for example promising or commanding. Following the usage of, for example, John R. Searle, speech act, is often meant to refer just to the same thing as the term illocutionary act, which John L. Austin had originally introduced in How to Do Things with Words published posthumously in 1962. Sorrell's work on speech acts is also commonly understood to refine Austin's conception. However, some philosophers have pointed out a significant difference between the two conceptions. Whereas Austin emphasized the conventional interpretation of speech acts, Searle emphasized a psychological interpretation based on beliefs, intentions, etc. According to Austin's preliminary and formal description, the idea of an illocutionary act can be captured by emphasizing that by saying something, we do something. As when someone issues an order to someone to go by saying, go, or when a minister joins two people in marriage saying, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Austin would eventually define the illocutionary act in a more exact manner. An interesting type of illocutionary speech act is that performed in the utterance of what Austin calls performatives, typical instances of which are, I nominate John to be president, I sentence you to ten years' imprisonment or, I promise to pay you back. In these typical, rather explicit cases of performative sentences, the action that the sentence describes nominating, sentencing, promising is performed by the utterance of the sentence itself. <laughs> Perlocutionary acts While illocutionary acts relate more to the speaker, perlocutionary acts are centered around the listener. Perlocutionary acts always have a perlocutionary effect which is the effect a speech act has on a listener. This could affect the listener's thoughts, emotions or even their physical actions. An example of this could be if someone uttered the sentence, I'm hungry. The perlocutionary effect on the listener would persuade them to maybe make a sandwich for the speaker. Topic. Indirect speech acts. In the course of performing speech acts we ordinarily communicate with each other. The content of communication may be identical, or almost identical, with the content intended to be communicated, as when a stranger asks, What is your name? However, the meaning of the linguistic means used if ever there are linguistic means, for at least some so-called speech acts, can be performed non-verbally may also be different from the content intended to be communicated. One may, in appropriate circumstances, request Peter to do the dishes by just saying, Peter. Or one can promise to do the dishes by saying, me, 
One common way of performing speech acts is to use an expression which indicates one speech act, and indeed performs this act, but also performs a further speech act, which is indirect. One may, for instance, say, Peter, can you close the window? Thereby asking Peter whether he will be able to close the window, but also requesting that he does so. Since the request is performed indirectly, by means of directly performing a question, it counts as an indirect speech act. An even more indirect way of making such a request would be to say, in Peter's presence in the room with the open window, I'm cold. The speaker of this request must rely upon Peter's understanding of several items of inexplicit information, that the window is open and is the cause of her being cold, that being cold is an uncomfortable sensation and she wishes it to be taken care of, and that Peter cares to rectify this situation by closing the window. This, of course, depends much on the relationship between the requester and Peter. He might understand the request differently if she were his boss at work than if she were his girlfriend at home. The more presumed information pertaining to the request, the more indirect the speech act may be considered to be. Indirect speech acts are commonly used to reject proposals and to make requests. For example, a speaker asks, Would you like to meet me for coffee? And another replies, I have class. The second speaker used an indirect speech act to reject the proposal. This is indirect because the literal meaning of, I have class, does not entail any sort of rejection. This poses a problem for linguists because it is confusing on a rather simple approach to see how the person who made the proposal can understand that his proposal was rejected. Following substantially an account of H. P. Grice, Searle suggests that we are able to derive meaning out of indirect speech acts by means of a cooperative process out of which we are able to derive multiple elocutions, however, the process he proposes does not seem to accurately solve the problem. Sociolinguistics has studied the social dimensions of conversations. This discipline considers the various contexts in which speech acts occur. In other words this means that one does not need to say the words apologize, pledge, or praise in order to show they are doing the action. All the examples above show how the actions and indirect words make something happen rather than coming out straightforward with specific words and saying it. History For much of the history of linguistics and the positivist philosophy of language, language was viewed primarily as a way of making factual assertions, and the other uses of language tended to be ignored, as Austin states at the beginning of Lecture 1. It was for too long the assumption of philosophers that the business of a statement can only be to describe some state of affairs, or to state some fact, which it must do either truly or falsely. Wittgenstein came up with the idea of don't ask for the meaning, ask for the use. Showing language as a new vehicle for social activity. Speech act theory hails from Wittgenstein's philosophical theories. Wittgenstein believed meaning derives from pragmatic tradition, demonstrating the importance of how language is used to accomplish objectives within specific situations. By following rules to accomplish a goal, communication becomes a set of language games. Thus, utterances do more than reflect a meaning, they are words designed to get things done. The work of J. L. Austin, particularly his How to Do Things with Words, led philosophers to pay more attention to the non-declarative uses of language. The terminology he introduced, especially the notions, locutionary act, illocutionary act, and perlocutionary act, occupied an important role in what was then to become the study of speech acts. All of these three acts, but especially the illocutionary act, are nowadays commonly classified as speech acts. Austin was by no means the first one to deal with what one could call speech acts in a wider sense. The term social act and some of the theory of this sui generis type of linguistic action are to be found in the fifth of Thomas Reed's essays on the active powers of the human mind 1788, chapter 6, of the nature of a contract. A man may see, and hear, and remember, and judge, and reason, he may deliberate and form purposes, and execute them, without the intervention of any other intelligent being. They are solitary acts. But when he asks a question for information, when he testifies a fact, when he gives a command to his servant, when he makes a promise, or enters into a contract, these are social acts of mind, and can have no existence without the intervention of some other intelligent being, who acts a part in them. 
between the operations of the mind, which, for want of a more proper name, I have called solitary, and those I have called social, there is this very remarkable distinction, that, in the solitary, the expression of them by words, or any other sensible sign, is accidental. They may exist, and be complete, without being expressed, without being known to any other person. But, in the social operations, the expression is essential. They cannot exist without being expressed by words or signs, and known to the other party. Adolf Reinach (1883–1917) and Stanislav Skrabek (1844–1918) have been both independently credited with a fairly comprehensive account of social acts as performative utterances dating to 1913, long before Austin and Searle. The term "speech act." had also been already used by Karl Buhler. The term metallocutionary act has also been used to indicate a speech act that refers to the forms and functions of the discourse itself rather than continuing the substantive development of the discourse, or to the configurational functions of prosody and punctuation. In language development Dorr proposed that children's utterances were realizations of one of nine primitive speech acts Labeling Repeating Answering Requesting action, Requesting answer Calling Greeting Protesting Practicing Topic. Formalization There is no agreed formalization of speech act theory. A first attempt to give some grounds of an illocutionary logic has been given by John Searle and D. Vanderveck in 1985. Other attempts have been proposed by Per Martin Lauf for a treatment of the concept of assertion inside intuitionistic type theory, and by Carlo Dalla Paza, with a proposal of a formal pragmatics connecting propositional content given with classical semantics and illocutionary force given by intuitionistic semantics. Up to now the main basic formal application of speech act theory are to be found in the field of human-computer interaction in chatboxes and other tools, see below. In computer science Computational speech act models of human computer conversation have been developed. Speech act theory has been used to model conversations for automated classification and retrieval. Another highly influential view of speech acts has been in the conversation for action developed by Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores in their 1987 text, Understanding Computers and Cognition: A New Foundation for Design. Arguably the most important part of their analysis lies in a state transition diagram in Chapter 5 that Winograd and Flores claim underlies the significant illocutionary speech act claims of two parties attempting to coordinate action with one another no matter whether the agents involved might be human-human, human-computer, or computer-computer. A key part of this analysis is the contention that one dimension of the social domain tracking the illocutionary status of the transaction whether individual participants claim that their interests have been met, or not is very readily conferred to a computer process, regardless of whether the computer has the means to adequately represent the real-world issues underlying that claim. Thus a computer instantiating the conversation for action has the useful ability to model the status of the current social reality independent of any external reality on which social claims may be based. This transactional view of speech acts has significant applications in many areas in which human individuals have had different roles. For instance, a patient and a physician might meet in an encounter in which the patient makes a request for treatment, the physician responds with a counter-offer involving a treatment she feels is appropriate, and the patient might respond, etc. Such a conversation for action can describe a situation in which an external observer such as a computer or health information system may be able to track the ILLOCUTIONARY or speech act status of negotiations between the patient and physician participants even in the absence of any adequate model of the illness or proposed treatments. The key insight provided by Winograd and Flores is that the state transition diagram representing the social illocutionary negotiation of the two parties involved is generally much, much simpler than any model representing the world in which those parties are making claims. In short, the system tracking the status of the conversation for action need not be concerned with modeling all of the realities of the external world. A conversation for action is critically dependent upon certain stereotypical claims about the status of the world made by the two parties. Thus a 
conversation for action can be readily tracked and facilitated by a device with little or no ability to model circumstances in the real world other than the ability to register claims by specific agents about a domain. Topic: Uses in technology. In making useful applications of technology to domains such as healthcare, it is helpful to discriminate between problems which are very, very hard such as deep understanding of pathophysiology as it relates to genetic and various environmental influences and problem which are relatively easier, such as following the status of negotiations between a patient and a healthcare provider. Speech Act illocutionary analysis allows for a useful understanding of the status of a negotiation between for instance a health care provider and a patient independent of any well accepted credible and comprehensive understanding of a disease process as it might apply to that patient. For this reason, systems which track the status of promises and rejected proposals and accepted promises can help us to understand the situations in which human or computer agents find themselves as they attempt to fulfill roles involving other agents, and such systems can facilitate both human and human computer systems in achieving role-associated goals. Topic. Rules In the past, philosophy has discussed rules for when expressions are used. The two rules are constitutive and regulative rules. The concept of constitutive rules finds its origin in Wittgenstein and Rawls, and has been elaborated by G. C. J. Midgley, Max Black, G. H. von Wright, David Schwader, and John Searle, whereas regulative rules are prescriptions that regulate a pre existing activity whose existence is logically independent of the rules, constitutive rules constitute an activity the existence of which is logically dependent on the rules. For example, traffic rules are regulative rules that prescribe certain behavior in order to regulate the traffic. Without these rules, however, the traffic would not cease to be. In contrast, the rules of chess are constitutive rules that constitute the game. Without these rules chess would not exist, since the game is logically dependent on the rules. In multi-agent universes Multi-agent systems sometimes use speech act labels to express the intent of an agent when it sends a message to another agent. For example the intent, inform, in the message. Inform content may be interpreted as a request that the receiving agent adds the item content to its knowledge base. This is in contrast to the message query content, which may be interpreted depending on the semantics employed as a request to see if the item content is currently in the receiving agent's knowledge base. There are at least two standardizations of speech act labeled messaging KQML and FIPA. KQML and FIPA are based on the Surlian, that is, psychological semantics of speech acts. Munandar P. Singh has long advocated moving away from the psychological to a social semantics of speech acts, one that would be in tune with Austin's conception. Andrew Jones has also been a critic of the psychological conception. A recent collection of manifestos by researchers in agent communication reflects a growing recognition in the multi-agent systems community of the benefits of a social semantics. Topic. Other uses in technology Sampo means speech act-based office modeling approach. Speech act profiling has been used to detect deception in synchronous computer-mediated communication. Topic. In political science In political science, the Copenhagen School adopts speech act as a form of felicitous speech act or simply facilitating conditions, whereby the speaker, often politicians or players, act in accordance to the truth but in preparation for the audience to take action in the directions of the player that are driven or incited by the act. This forms an observable framework under a specified subject matter from the player, and the audience who are under theorized would remain outside of the framework itself, and would benefit from being both brought in and drawn out. It is because the audience would not be informed of the intentions of the player, except to focus on the display of the speech act itself. Therefore, in the perspective of the player, the truth of the subject matter is irrelevant except the result produced via the audience. The study of speech acts is prevalent in legal theory since laws themselves can be interpreted as speech acts. Laws issue out a command to their constituents which can be realized as an action. 
When forming a legal contract, speech acts can be made when people are making or accepting an offer. Considering the theory of freedom of speech, some speech acts may not be legally protected. For example, a death threat is a type of speech act and is considered to exist outside of the protection of freedom of speech as it is treated as a criminal act. Topic. In finance In finance, it is possible to understand mathematical models as speech acts. The notion of financial logos is defined in Walter 2016 as the speech act of mathematical financial risk models. The action of the financial logos on financial practices is the following, the framing of financial decision making by risk modeling. Topic see also topic Notes topic Bibliography John Langshaw Austin, How to Do Things with Words. Cambridge, Mass., 1962, Paperback, Harvard University Press, 2nd edition, 2005, ISBN 0-674-41152-8. William P. Alston, Illocutionary Acts and Sentence Meaning. Ithaca, Cornell University Press 2000, ISBN 0-8014-3669-9. Bach, Kent. Speech Acts, Speech Acts. Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, N. D. Webb, 10 February 2014. Dorg, Friedrich Christoph. Illocutionary Acts, Austin's Account and What Searle Made Out of It. Tübingen 2006. Dorschel, Andreas, What Is It to Understand a Directive Speech Act? In, Australasian Journal of Philosophy LXVII, 1989, N.R. 3, pp. 319-340. John Searle, Speech Acts, Cambridge University Press 1969, ISBN 0-521-09626-X. John Searle, Indirect Speech Acts, in Syntax and Semantics, 3, Speech Acts, ed. P. Cole and J. L. Morgan, pp. 59-82. New York, Academic Press, 1975. Reprinted in Pragmatics, a reader, ed. S. Davis, pp. 265-277. Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1991, Geo Siegwert, Alethic Acts and Alethiological Reflection. An Outline of Constructive Philosophy of Truth, in Truth and Speech Acts, Studies in the Philosophy of Language, ed. D. Griman and G. Siegwert, pp. 41-58. New York, Routledge, 2007, Winograd, T. and Floris, F., Understanding Computers and Cognition, A New Foundation for Design, Ablix Publishing Corp., Norwood, 1986. ISBN 0-89391-050-3. Birgit Erler, The Speech Act of Forbidding and Its Realizations, A Linguistic Analysis. Sarbrücken, VDM Verlag Dr. Muller, 2010, ISBN 978-3-639-23275-2. Robert Maximilian de Gainsford, Illocutionary Acts, Subordination, and Silencing in Analysis, July 2009. Audi, Malmivuori, zu Stand und Entwicklung der Sprechaktheorie. Zu Grundsätzen der Theorie des Spatchlichen Handelains. Akademiker Verlag. 2012. ISBN 978-3-639-44043-0. Matt McDonald, Securitization and the Construction of Security. University of Warwick, 2008. Barry Buzan, Ole Weber and Yap de Wilde, Security, A New Framework for Analysis. Colorado Boulder, Lynn Riener, 1998. Topic external links Speech Acts Entry from Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, by Kent Bach Barry Smith, Towards a History of Speech Act Theory Ed. M. McDonald, pp. 2-3. Warwick, University of Warwick, 2008 Foundation for Intelligent Physical Agent Speech Acts. Mitchell Green, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Strategies for Learning Speech Acts in Japanese by Noriko Ishihara Mumni, Hassan, 2005. Politeness in Parliamentary Discourse, a Comparative Pragmatic Study of British and Moroccan M. Speech Acts at Question Time. Unpub. Ph.D. Thesis. Muhammad V University, Rabat, Morocco. S. L., Stanislav Skrabek.